Welcome to some new r slash malicious compliance stories, where people comply to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. I hope you had a great day. Thanks for all the likes and comments on the last video. If you would like to support this channel, please hit the like button and consider subscribing if you enjoy the content. And now let's start with the first story. It's called Red Cook. I used to work for the Dirty Bird. I told my immediate management team for over two years that you can't operate a kitchen with just one person, especially one that works with raw chicken, and that they couldn't expect everything to be done in a timely, food-safe manner. They finally decided to listen to me and allowed me to start training some of the staff that was available to work school hours. I was told to make sure I taught them properly, that they had to be able to pass a restaurant compliance check. This wasn't a problem. I knew I could do that, I'd been working in that kitchen for about 10 years. The restaurant got purchased by another company and they changed quite a few things and started trying to enforce insane requirements related to sales being made with the staff on shift. We went from free front, free drive through lane, one burger, two cooks and a person floating wherever needed on our busiest nights to 1, 2, 1, 1, 0 respectively. The malicious compliance comes in around here. The day I was supposed to train the first person, We'll call her Tina, I was only given half an hour for either side of lunch wash prep and lunch wash itself. The first half hour goes fine. I get them acquainted with the kitchen, how things should run and what's expected of them over lunch. As we start getting into lunch wash, every few minutes my manager is yelling out that they need Tina to help out with the drive through Tina tried to argue this, as did I. They had the normal stuff they'd have any other day, plus it was one of the quieter days, so really they should have been fine. Eventually, the manager comes out of the kitchen and tells me they are taking Tina and putting her on burgers. I've had it by now and I just say alright, fine, but you better make yourself available to come out here and help because I'm not breaking your instructions about training them. Normally I could prepare a full run of choke in under 10 minutes, the fastest in the store, but not today. Today I was gonna painstakingly examine every piece of chicken to make sure there wasn't anything left on them at all. Bruce piece? In the bin. A knob on the tie full of feathers. Normally I tear the knob off and save myself a few minutes, but not today. I'm supposed to pluck every last feather off that knob. Eventually my manager comes out of the office because the person serving front counter has started whining at them because I had the cookers going off and wasn't doing anything about them. They asked what's going on and I told them, sorry, I'm red cook today. Company policies are red cook doesn't lift product up for any reason. Besides, as you can see, I'm still preparing the last one you gave me and I can't leave raw chicken unattended. You could practically see the steam coming off them, but I didn't care. I could hear the hangry customers yelling at my manager because their food was taking so long. But I had a point to prove and I was sticking to it. The manager finally gives up, comes out to the kitchen defeated and starts dealing with the cooked product instead of sitting in the office on their phone. I never did get it through to them that if they want a kitchen to run in a food safe manner with the speed of a fast food restaurant, they needed more people. But that wasn't my problem. A few months later, I'd quit the place anyways and they struggled to get anyone that was willing to pull 7am to 6pm shifts because all the school kids would never show up on time. The next story is called Exposed Phone Line. Years ago, I worked in technical support for an Australian ISP. My colleague, let's call him Dave, and I both supported ADSL1 and ADSL2 Plus connections running over PSTN. All the copper running between the telephone exchange and customer premises was owned by a third party, and my company sold ADSL and phone services over their lines. Dave got a call from a customer who bought the property from a previous owner. The property was over 100 years old, which is really old in Australia, near the center of a major city. The previous owner was an old lady who only had a phone line there. They decided to renovate it and introduce basics like internet access. They call Dave and Dave can obviously hear their noise on the line. The copper lines, likely 60 plus years old, are probably to blame. Dave lodges the fault with Telstra. A few days later they go out and fix the issue. Dave has the internet connected at the customer's property and the speeds are below 1.5 but the line length indicates they should be getting at least 8 megabits per second. The customer had all the wiring in the house we done during the renovation and brought up to modern spec, so we know it's not the customer's wiring. 1.5 megabits per second is the minimum speed the line has to hit, so they go ahead and lodge an ADSL fault. Telstra sends a tag. Tag report says, no fault found. 
the customer gets slung with 200 plus Australian dollars in incorrect callout fees. The internet is still crap. Dave and the customer go back and forth, eventually filing multiple phone and ADSL faults. It's obvious that the copper is bad, because when it rains, there's noise on the line, but when the line dries out, the noise goes away. After multiple faults filed, Telstra finally sends out a team who dig up the line between the customer's house and the street. But due to some stupid reason, the trench crew have to leave before the Tesla tech dude even arrives to replace the wire. So the trenching crew fills in the trench to not leave an unaccounted hazard. The Tesla tech comes later on, replaces the line and just leaves it running over the front lawn, given that the trench is filled in. The customer calls in, absolutely livid. When will the Tesla crew come in to bury the line? Dave checks with the wholesale contact, who tells him that the fault is resolved and the issue is closed. Nobody is coming. The customer asks if they can bury the line themselves, but our sending orders are to heavily discourage that. The cable is property of Telstra and the trench has to be certain spec and other stuff. Dave informs him that they should not do it. The customer calls around with a few companies who do such work, but the moment he tells them he wants them to bury our Telstra in place, they all know out of the job. A few days later, the customer called, wanting us to do something. We have nothing we can do. The line is working properly now, so there is no fault. Ultimately, Telstra knows about the issue. Telstra's tech left it that way and noted so in his report. They just don't care. Dave asks the customers for pictures of the cable. With the pictures, Dave goes to the Telstra wholesale. After calling in a few favors, he manages to convince the dude at Telstra to add the issue to what they call a project list, which is a formal list of network segments needing improvement. But the list is prioritized by severity and impact. And the Tesla wholesale guy tells Dave that there's no ETA and there are products on this list that have sat there for 10 plus years. Dave informs the customer and they are willing to give it a few months to see if Tesla does anything. Six months later, they call. There's been no movement. There likely won't be any movement. So the customer asks Dave, so you are telling me that the line is not supposed to run over open ground. And Tesla knows that and they know the line is exposed and they still won't do anything? Pretty much. And what happens if it gets damaged? Telstra has a legal obligation to keep the telephone line working, in case of emergency, so they must fix it within 2-5 to five working days. And who pays for that? Telstra does. It's their property. You only pay if there is no fault, for the tax time. This is why we cannot lodge a fault right now. Your line is working. But if it was not working, we could lodge a fault and they would fix it at their cost. Hmm. Okay. A couple of days later, the customer called. Their phone is down. Their brother-in-law managed to snag the line and damaged it with his car. Dave lodges a fault. Telstra comes out, fixes it, leaving the line above ground. A few weeks later, the customer calls again. They were mowing the lawn and they hit the line with the lawn mower blade. No phone. Fault fired. Telstra comes out and pays for the fix. The line is still above ground. A month later, the wife was gardening and accidentally put a shovel through the line. He apologized profusely. Fault fired. Tesla fixes, Tesla pays, line still not buried. You get the idea. Every few weeks or month they call with a more outrageous scenario that caused damage to the line. Every call out is at a minimum 200 Australian dollars a pop for Tesla. After the sixth fault is fixed, Dave called the customer for a follow up call to check if everything is working. The customer says it is. And funnily enough, Tesla tech brought along a trenching crew who buried the line properly. And with that, we end today's video. Let me know what you think about the stories. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate the stories and today's video? I hope you enjoyed the video. If you like what I do and want to support me, please subscribe and hit the like button. I hope you have a great day. Stay safe. Bye bye.